so I'm Bob Skiba. Um, I have been tour guiding for way too long, over 20 years now. Um, and I've been with APT from the beginning. So all of you, welcome and thanks for being on. And I give tours all, all over the city, but I especially like to give tours uh, in Midtown because not many other people do. So the area between, say, Independence Park and City Hall, city hall that, that So tonight I'm gonna to talk about one of my favorite subjects. And let me start, start sharing my screen with you. jump right in here, Camac Street. And I love Camac Street. Why, why did I love Camac Street even, be ever, even before I ever walked on it? Because as far as I know, Camac is the only palindrome street in Philadelphia. Now as tour guides, if any of you know of any other street in the city that spell the same forwards and backwards, let me know. But for right now, Kamak earns that title of being the only palindrome street in the city. So I love it. When I started researching the uh, history of Kamak Street, and I did because it's right in the middle of what's called Philadelphia's Gayborhood. I also work as the archivist at the William Way Center. So I'm interested in all aspects of the city's history. And Kamak really has a wonderful wonderful history. I think how special is it to live in a city where I can talk about a tiny two block area of a side street and give an hour talk and still not get give everything in. And I think any tour guide in the city worth their salt, I was told, can stand on any street corner and talk for an hour. Uh, and I think that's that's probably true. So let's talk about Kamak Street. And this this is a wonderful engraving that that's colored, and it's from the twenties. And it's kind of showing an old-fashioned, stylized view of Kamak. Kamak really didn't look like this. It's looking north, from just just a little bit north of Spruce Street. Kamak didn't quite look this rustic then, but they wanted you to believe it was. So let's let's jump right in, start talking about that. All right, let me see. Oh, there it is. So this is a map of the area about 1830. And this is Kanak here, which was called uh, Dean Street in 1830. Kanak first appears on maps pretty early, about 1813 or so, as Hazel Alley. It appears in city directories. All of you know, you're all tour guides, you know that the city really grew up along the Delaware and grew west. So even by the 1860s, west of City Hall was not much built up. So Kamak Street, for some strange reason, was built up fairly early. The tiny houses that we see on Kamak really date from the 1820s. So it first appears in city directories about 1813 as Hazel Alley, by the end of the 18 teens, by about 1817 or 1818, it appears as Dean Alley, and then it's upgraded and called Dean Street by 1890. And that's what you would have known it through most of the 19th century, up until the late 1890s. Uh, now, when you research the names of Philadelphia streets and you look at ma maps, you find something important happened about 1896 or so. Before then, many small streets in the city changed name every few blocks. And that's both running north and south and east and west. That's because developers would buy the, would buy the blocks or buy the rights to the blocks and they'd want to give the street their own name. Well, about 1896, the city decided to regularize the names of the streets. So they would follow a street from river to river, even if it was a tiny street, and all the way up into North Philadelphia and all the way south, south Philadelphia and regularize the name to one name. And that's what happened with Kemak Street. And there was a Kemak Street north of Broad Street, and some of you may know that Kemak Street up there, that runs all the way up through North Philadelphia. And it was named after the Kemak, Kemak family, founded by a sea captain named Turner Kemak. And that's where the name comes from. So 
by about 1896 or so, Gene Street here has become Chemac Street. And through most of the middle of the 19th century, toward the end of the 19th century, Chemac was a quiet little residential street. The houses on it mostly are tiny two-story houses. There was a little classical academy on one side of the street, uh, a school, but generally the school, the street was a working class area. I know this because when I go through references and find it in the Inquirer, it's middle class people who are looking, that give that as their home address, who are looking for work. On top of that, some of them are African American. So it was a mixed working class neighborhood. So we'd say so-and-so black looking for work in a domestic situation. So to work as a maid or to work doing laundry, something like that. Or so-and-so white is looking for a job in a small office or factory work, things like that. So we know that uh, Kim actually was not an upper class area. And that happened a lot in Philadelphia. Uh, when the blocks began to fill out, the big streets, Chestnut, Spruce, Pine, uh, way down on the east one, where the big houses were, slightly smaller houses on the north south streets, the numbered streets, and the smallest houses were always on the alleys. So even though we didn't have a real uh, segregated kind of slum, wealthy area, um, the way you, the way the city was broken up uh, by income was on the sides of the street you lived in. And I think that's important. Well, the character of Chemac Street really, really doesn't begin to change until the early 20th century. And that's when clubs in the city. Now, you know the city of Philadelphia in the 19th century was called the city of clubs. We had clubs for everything. We had artistic clubs, we had scientific clubs, we had literary clubs, and they really flourished all over the city. Some of them were divided by social class, were for upper class people, some of them were for middle class people, and there were even separate clubs for the African American community here in Florida who were not allowed into the white clubs. Um, Philadelphia, of course, loved to call itself the city of clubs, claiming that it was the Athens of America. Um, and when I research a lot of club records, this is what I found, that the clubs sometimes managed to barely survive, but they managed to stay in the black for one reason. All of you know that Philadelphia was a horrible city to try to get liquor in seven days a week, but all bars were closed on Sunday. Those of you who are older or have been around a while know that restaurants couldn't serve alcohol in Philadelphia until the, until the 1970s even. There were no baseball games in Philadelphia on Sunday until the 1930s. Well, clubs were that exception. So if you had a private club license, you could serve alcohol to your guests. So my own feeling is that uh, clubs were so popular in Philadelphia, not necessarily because we were so cultured. We were. We absolutely were. But because if you were a club member, you could get a drink on Sunday in your club and you could do so legally. So we have Kenak Street. I did some reading and somehow it's got, there's a lot of misinformation about Kenak Street. Uh, I might not call it misinformation. I might call it uh, there are a lot of stories about uh, about Chemac Street that may or may not be true. And as tour guides, we're all familiar with those kind of stories. Well, one story is that by the end of the 19th century, Chemac was a really rough street full of little gambling dens and houses of prostitution. I'll, I'll address that later. But what happens in the early 20th century is this tiny street changes because some of the clubs in the city decide to move there. One of the earliest clubs you see on the left is the Sketch Club, which was still there, which moves in in 1902. 
And the sketch club was founded by many members who belong to PAFA, who belong to the Academy of Fine Arts, who decided that Philadelphia needed a place where artists could get together to support each other. And the sketch club still is the oldest private uh, arts club in the country. Um, very soon, next to it, down the block, many of you have walked by this building, I, I'm so surprised when I see people walk by this building and don't know what it is, but it's the Franklin Inn Club. And actually I gave, a I gave this talk to the Franklin Inn Club a couple of weeks ago. And the Franklin Inn Club, uh, which is on the corner of Chancellor and Kamak, um, and, and, and it's just kind of is invisible in the environment there, uh, is a club for people involved in the writing and publishing industry. Uh, those standards have been lowered a little bit. The original club was just across the street on Chancellor Street in 1902. Here's the original club room. This is what the club room looks like today. I've been in there two or three times. It's a wonderful old musty club. If you ever get invited to the Franklin in go, absolutely go. Um, it's got a little over 100 members now. Uh, I've been there for talks. They do talks uh, every Thursday. They usually don't do them during the summer, but these are special times. So when the club moved in, what they took this building over in 1907, bought three separate row houses, joined them together, and then redid the facade so they look, it looked like a colonial inn. It's a fake, it's a pseudo colonial inn but it's a really charming space inside. Uh, I was there about 10 or 15 years ago, and it was in kind of charming disrepair. Um, there was paint peeling off inside, and you could smell mold. Uh, it's been cleaned up a lot. It really looks lovely now. So the Franklin Inn opened 1902, and then moves into this building in 1907. A little further down the Kamak Street, um, at 19, uh, uh, at um, 247, 249 South Kamak Street, is the Plastics Club. And this is the outside, and this is a recent art sale. And this is a photo of being some people in the inside of the club in um, 1909 when it was founded. And the Plastic Club was founded as the first women's art organization in the city. And many of the women had studied at PAPA at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts. And the, this is a representation of what were called the Red Rose Girls, who were all artists who supported each other. And probably the most famous person of this group is Violet Oakley, whom you've probably heard of, who did the murals in the Pennsylvania State House. So slowly at the beginning of the 20th century, the character of Kamak Street was changing and it was getting a new nickname. It was called the Little Street of Clubs. And it was kind of fashioning a new identity for itself. It was a very self-conscious identity. It was building itself as an old shoddy street in a major city, in a major old city that was reinventing itself. So this is an ad for the evening public led ledger, not quite large enough, but it's interesting because it's 1916 and it's saying two things are unique about Philadelphia. Uh, this is the Manufacturers Club, which is uh, on South Broad Street, and these are instances of Kamak Street. And it's saying two things that make Philadelphia really unique is that it's a great city for business. It's a booming city for business, but it has tiny little streets full of historical character, sorry, um, like Kamak Street. So it's beginning to use Kamak Street in advertising as something that's really unique toward Philly. And Kamak Street begins appearing in Architectural Digest as a street that's representative of something new of an old, tired, rundown section of a metropolitan area that's being reinvented and reimagined. I want to jump in here because it's just about this time 
late 19 teens that we see this happening in Kamak. So this is a little sidebar. And all of you know that Kamak was one of the last city, last streets in the city that had its original wooden paving. Not quite original, it's been done over a few times, but it was one of the last streets with wooden paving. I think if we were to look under the asphalt of uh, quite a number of miles of paving in the city, we would find a lot of old uh, wooden paving. This is a story of wooden paving in Philadelphia. Uh, they tried it in the 1830s. They did a section of Chestnut Street between 7th and 8th. They thought this would be great. Think about a city, think about what a city sounded like in the 19th century. Uh, by the late century, there were trolley cars, there were bells clinging. What you heard really was the rattle of wagons and the clop, clop, clop of horses. And they thought wooden paving would be a great way to quiet the city, to make it more genteel, to make it more uh, welcoming to people. So in the mid 1830s, they tried it as an experiment on Chestnut Street, which of course was the commercial center of the city then, between 7th and 8th Street. And they put down sand and they put down gravel, put these wooden blocks in. Well, later on that week was a torrential rain and all the blocks lifted up and floated down the street. So that was the end of that for a while. There was one other problem, of course, is that uh, cobblestone and later on Belgian block are really durable. And we have lots of streets that are left over from the 19th century in Philly uh, that are the original Belgian block because it's so durable. But wood tends to splinter and disintegrate. But a method of hardening the wood was invented in the late 19th century. And we use it today when we build porches and outdoor decks. We use hardened wood that doesn't disintegrate out in the weather. Uh, it can be sticky, it can ooze creosote, it can smell not so great. Uh, Chicago and New York had miles of wooden street by the 19th, late 19th century. Partially because of the, I think, um, the bad example that happened at Chestnut Street in the 1830s, it wasn't much used in Philly until the late 1910s. So a lot of people who see these old wooden streets think they date from the 19th century, they don't. They date, they date from the 1910s. And that's where, especially the merchants on Market Street, East Market Street, um, where all the department stores were, thought we need to find a way to quiet things down, Women in the stores can't even hear the cashiers or the salespeople because there's so much noise on the street. So it's estimated that between about 1917 and 1919, there were over 20 miles of wooden streets laid out in Philadelphia. One by one, they were covered over. Why? Uh, because asphalt be became more popular. It happened that they were making wooden streets exactly at the time that the automobile was becoming popular with individuals. And of course, it's much uh, nicer to drive automobiles on asphalt, even than on wooden streets. Uh, it, it's not so pleasant on Belgian block or cobblestone. If any of you have ridden in a bus, down Fifth Street or anywhere around Independence Hall, you heard the noise that driving over Belgian blocks makes, and it's not very pleasant. So, Kamak Street was one of the last streets that kept its wooden block. They deteriorated, especially by the early 20th century. 1977 was the first time, uh, and you can see here, these guys working on the street in 1977 that the blocks were restored and you can see these oh, oh sorry these i keep hitting the button these blocks here look a lot like bricks look a lot like belgian blocks uh they're rectangulars the ones they did in 1977 disintegrated right away so by the 1990s the street looked like this it was a mess in 1997, they had been restored at a cost of about a million bucks. And the contractor told the city officials, it'll last 20 years. Well, it didn't. 
The entire street was repaved in 2008. Here it is being replaced in 2008. And that began to disintegrating right away. Uh, the story that I've heard, and I talked to a guy who actually worked on it, was that they didn't do the right kind of foundation for it. They didn't allow for drainage, so water stayed in the street. When the water froze, it cracked the wood, and it rotted the wood from the bottom. So in beginning in 2015, they started slowly covering over that street. I hated to see it go. I really did. And by 2018, as you can see in the lower right-hand corner two years ago, it was entirely gone. Earlier on this year, I heard from people in the Preservation Alliance, from Mr. Paul Stanky, that there was money set aside by the city to redo the street and to redo it right. And that was supposed to happen beginning this year. It hasn't. And I'm pretty sure that because of the huge budget shortfalls, this is not going to happen anytime because of COVID-19. Um, this is not going to be happening anytime soon. So right now, Kamak, the last street in the city paved with wood, is not coming back anytime soon. So I'm really sorry to say that. So here we have the street filled with clubs, filled with little art clubs and literary clubs and somewhere eating clubs too, we'll talk about those. Uh, and this is a view from the 1920s. And I love this view. And this is looking south on Kamak, Spruce Street is in the back. I love that there's still a, a gas street light here. Uh, and you can see art hung out here. So, Especially in the summer through the fall, Kamak Street would shut down. They would do little street fairs. And it would really market itself as a little bohemian area in the city. Uh, on the other side, on the, this would be the west side of the street. This place here is called the studio. It was a photography studio owned by a man named William Rao, R A U, who took pictures. Uh, of a lot of the society families in Philadelphia. So he was kind of, that, having a photographer's studio there just kind of added to the Bohemian area. There were lots of, there were little cafes and restaurants. It was the 20s, you can bet that most of those restaurants and off the beaten track places were speakeasies. They absolutely were, I'd be surprised. By 1920 or so, just about a little bit before this picture was taken, you see this. What does this mean, Maxine's in the village? Um, this matchbook I have in my collection, I have a big collection of matchbooks from Center City, Philadelphia, going back to the 1930s. Uh, and I'll, I'll post them all sometime as show and tell, but they're great. And this one is from a bar called Maxine's, the, the bar is still there on the street, we'll talk about it in a while, but it's called In the Village. By 1922 or so, this little tiny strip, right in downtown Philadelphia, was calling itself Philadelphia's Greenwich Village. Now it's far from Greenwich Village, but Greenwich Village in New York is certainly much larger, but it got the name because of the clubs, because of the artistic and literary clubs, uh, the bohemian kind of people who live there, but it's already getting a reputation as a place where kind of um, uh, gay and non-gender conforming people were hanging out. As one newspaper described it, Kamak Street was full of long-haired women and short-haired men. And uh, I'm sorry, short-haired women and long-haired men. And we all know what that's code for. They were talking about gay people and drag queens and things like that. So by the 1920s, uh, Kamak had this reputation or so. And they would do these art festivals uh, several times during the summer kind of to promote this image of Kamak Street. And they start calling Kamak Street the Little Street of Clubs. Another name they're using by the 1920s is Kamak, the biggest little street in the world. So let's start talking about the individual buildings on Kamak Street and kind of go up and down um, 
up and down, up and down the block. Uh, there's a little building, many of you know about the preservation efforts to save the back of the building that was the 12th Street Gym on 12th Street. On the back side on Kamak Street, it was the Kamak Street Dabs, which opened in 1929 as what was called a Schwitz, a place for businessmen, Jewish businessmen to go and relax during the day. You can picture them all sitting in steam rooms with cigars and towels, uh, but it was also open, open to women. And it was in this building here. This is Chancellor Street and this is Kamak. I keep hitting that button, sorry. And the building that the Kamak Baths were in, which didn't close until the 1980s, by the way, and then were bought out by 12th Street Gym, was the powerhouse and the laundry facilities for this building, which is on the southeast corner of Walnut and 13th Street. Uh, and that building is still very much there. Uh, and that building began life as the St. James Hotel. The, this building here with the Kamak Street sign on it. And this picture is from about 1931 or so. So here's the St. James Hotel. This building here on the corner of Kamak, a little further to the east, was the annex for that. And this building here where the Kamak Baths were began as the powerhouse. And so the place where all the electric works and the generators were, as well as the laundry uh, for the St. James Hotel. Now, I read that underneath Chancellor Street, so the St. James would be up here. So I'm running underneath Chancellor Street and then up 13th Street to the St. James was a tunnel that's supposed to still be there. And the tunnel is supposed to be about five feet high, big enough for someone to kind of crawl through, not quite safe. And I'd love to see it. I'd love to see it. Uh, Philadelphia is honeycombed with tunnels. Uh, there are tunnels under Camac Street, and I like to tell this story. Because we had so many clubs, uh, Philadelphia had a gigantic opinion of itself through the 19th and early, and all of you know this. We were very proud of our history. We were still calling ourselves um, uh, the Athens of America. Uh, and we like to say Philadelphia is honeycombed with tunnels because we were a major stop on the Underground Railroad. So good, honest Philadelphians who were concerned about equality and freedom were hiding runaway freedom seekers in their tunnel. Well, maybe, maybe. The fact is, remember when I told you about prohibition? Um, I think that most of those tunnels date from the 1920s where people were hiding their hooch down under their basements. Uh, and, and I think that's probably true. I give prohibition tours of Philadelphia. And when people ask me, can you point out a speakeasy? I say, I'd have a harder time pointing out a place that wasn't in Center City, especially. To put it in perspective, today we have about 1,200 legal uh, liquor licenses for establishments in the city. They estimate that any year during Prohibition, there were over 12,000 speakeasies in the city. And I don't doubt that for a minute. When it came to Prohibition, Philadelphia pretty much decided to ignore it. I, I haven't talked to anybody who grew up in the city who didn't tell me, whose family has been here for a while, that their grandparents were not involved with either making wine or booze in their basements in the 1920s. Uh, and I love to hear those stories. But that's a whole other lecture, the Prohibition lecture. So let's move on. Let's move on to this building now, which all of you uh, have seen. And this is on Chancellor Street. It's now Wire Nightclub. And for a long time, it's been kind of a gay after hours club. But here's the history of this building. I always wonder what this large building was doing uh, in the middle of this tiny street. Well, it was built about 1910, between 1900 and 1910, as a bakery for this guy here, Jules Junker. 
who had his bakery outlet on 13th Street and Chancellor. I think there's, it's next to a pizza place and there's a cigar shop there now in that building. But, but that was the retail store for his bakery. And she lived directly um, around the corner on Locust Street. So this building would have faced onto not Chancellor, but St. James uh, Street. So he lived right here. And I'm gonna, I just want to mention this quickly, but this building that he lived in, it's hard to read here, but it was the children's department of the Free Library of Philadelphia. Um, um, all of you should know this, but you may not. But the last home of the Free Library was in that parking lot on the corner of 13th and Locust, where that big arts mural is right now, uh, which was the original home of the College of Physicians and the Mütter Museum. But from about 1912 until the middle of the 1920s, it was the last home of the Free Library. So the children's department was here, right around the corner on Locust Street. Well, there's something really interesting about Jules Junker. He must have been, um, he must have done really well for himself. Uh, his name shows up in the papers. His neighbors keep suing him because this building is here, his bakery. And you know this, bread is delivered early in the morning. So starting at four o'clock in the morning, his bakery trucks and horses and wagons would clop, clop, clop down uh, Chancellor Street to deliver the bread and the neighbors would complain. But there's something really important about Jules Junker. He was an automobile aficionado and he's listed in newspapers at the time and, and later on as being the first person to own a privately owned automobile in the city. And this is, this is not a picture of his automobile, but it's the same model. He had his automobile shipped over from France in 1899. This must have cost a fortune. And that's how I know he did really well in his bakery business. Um, so he had this automobile brought over and he used it kind of as a toy for his wife and daughters who tooled around in it all over the city. And you can see this article up here in the upper right hand corner. They were continually being given tickets because automobiles were banned from Fairmount Park. They thought Fairmount Park is going to, the automobiles would scare all the carriages of the people who were out for a Sunday ride and there. And they were not sure that automobiles were safe to allow in the park. So here we have the story of Jules Junker. Uh, here is one of his bakery trucks here. And this is a slightly later picture. This is from the late teens because it's a horseless carriage. It's, a way, it's an automobile wagon, it really is. Uh, so that's the story of Jules Junker. So this club here, this building here stayed, the bakery didn't move out until the 1930s. Let me see if I can go to the next slide. And then this is what happens. First of all, and this is when the character of that neighborhood starts to change. That neighborhood today that we call the neighborhood was right off Broad Street, which was an entertainment area already. You know that there were several theaters along there as well as hotels. So business people staying in the city on Broad Street would make their way down Locust, and up 13th Street and come back for entertainment. After World War II, Philadelphia saw a huge rise in what were called musical bars. These were bars that had live entertainment. So people would come into the city, go out for a show or spend the evening, go out for dinner, and then go out for dancing or entertainment afterwards. And this really picks up after World War II. And the first club to open there is the Club Mocambo. And this is right after World War II. We're talking about 1946. It's a very posh nightclub. There was a huge, uh, a huge frenzy for Latin inspired. Think about Ricky Ricardo and think about I Love Lucy. This exactly was going on in the 1940s. Every nightclub in the city had a rumba band. So the Macambo was a Latin theme. Um, 
and it's open only from about 1946, 1948. It's very posh, but think about this. It's way off the beaten path. It's on Chancellor Street. It's off, it's, it's on a tiny side street off another side street, Kamak. So, Macombo changes. Uh, in late 1948, it's bought by someone who all of you may, some of you may know, uh, and you may know the name Sam Lefty Katz. Now, ring a bell with any of you? Some of you who've been around and probably know that name. Uh, Katz was real, I could do a talk just on Sam Katz, on Lefty Katz, because he was really quite a character. He tried to get a uh, Playboy Club opened in Philadelphia in the 1980s. It absolutely went nowhere. But he opened a private club there called the 2-4. And it was a key club. Speaking of uh, uh, Playboy Club, don't you know what key clubs is? A key club is a restaurant and bar that you need to have a membership card to get in. So Playboy Clubs had these key cards that had actual keys printed on them. So you needed to be a member to go in. So here you have a membership club on a side street, off a side street. And that didn't last very long either. It was called the 2-4 Club. I wanna make another point. I've talked about private clubs in Philadelphia and about liquor licenses. It enters in enough. If you look at a lot of restaurants in the city that have had uh, liquor licenses since just the end of Prohibition, there's a reason that they got those liquor licenses early. And his bar, restaurant, was called the 2-4 Club. Why? Because the license was attached to a political club called the 24th Ward Young Men's Association. And that's still the incorporation name of the club that's there now, Voyeur. So we're talking about 60 years later, still operating under that name. Why? Because at the end of Prohibition, when the city was giving out legitimate liquor licenses, the first place they gave it to were private clubs who had had liquor licenses before the end of Prohibition. So any locality that had any kind of a club attached to it at all dragged out that incorporation papers and used them to get a liquor license today. So I know this happens with a lot of clubs in the city, especially with gay bars in the city that have these weird political names. And the bar that's really, that's there right now, uh, still operates as the 24th Ward Young Men's Association. And it kind of drags on, changes names, um, doesn't become really popular. In the 1970s, early 1966 through 70, I love this. It becomes a place called Mickey Finn's with banjo players and with barbershop quartets and this hokey kind of country atmosphere. Well, that only lasts four years. And then the place shuts down in 1970 for a couple months here and there, it reopens in other places, but it really becomes a, um, really a gay bar in 1973, 74, becomes a bar called the Land of Oz, kind of a lesbian bar, and then becomes a place called the DCA. Uh, and again, DCA, um, which was there for many years, from 75 to about 86, was operating, DCA stands for Dick's Community Athletic Association. Again, it's this fake club name. And I, I always wondered if that's why we call bar, in the 70s we referred to bars as clubs too. Not only because you needed a private membership to get in, but I think it's a holdover from when they were actual uh, clubs as well. And DCA, of course, later on became pure. Uh, since the 1970s, it's mostly been an after hours gay bar, which is still what it is now. So all of this that began as Junkers um, Bakery is now an after hours gay bar. Let's move a little further, a little further south on the block now to the to the area between we're talking the area between uh, Locust and Spruce. So going south, I wanted to talk about what is probably the oldest gay bar in the city. And this is a picture looking down uh, Kemak Street 
This is very early. This is 1932. And if you look behind this gas lamp, remember this gas lamp post from the 1920s pictures? There's someone standing in the doorway here. And that's the location of a place called Maxine's. In 1932, still would have been a speakeasy. This photo here is just from a few years later. This is from 1936, and this is looking the other direction. So this is looking south. This would be looking from here this way down. Oh, damn it. Damn it to hell. All right. Uh, and you see the little tiny Maxine's bar sign there. So it's gone legitimate. Now this picture is from a book that I have an original of uh, called the WPA Guide to Philadelphia. During the 1930s, the government subsidi subsidized uh, something that was called the National Writers Project. And they sent writers around to different cities to write guides to the city. If all, there is, I know there's a copy of the WPA Guide to Philadelphia available in digital form online. So you should all Google it and look for it. But it gives um, walking tours that you can do. It gives about six sample walking tours. So it's wonderful to see people where they send people in 1936. But this is a caveat. I find a lot of kind of fairy tales and wonderful stories and folklore about Kimak Street. And most of it stems back to this book. Think about this. Who's doing this book? It's not historians, writers. And writers are more concerned with telling a good story, and none of us are guilty of this, uh, than with actually telling real facts. So the people who wrote the WPA guide in 1936 often wrote things that were not quite true. And so I come across this mis misinformation again and again. This is where the original stories about Kamak Street being a rough area in the 1880s and 90s, full of gambling uh, dens and uh, houses of prostitution, all can be traced back to this one book. Uh, and I think it probably was not true because it doesn't show up in the newspapers anymore of any arrests being there or I've never seen it corroborated with any other source. Uh, and this is looking down Kamak Street in the 1950s. So Maxine's began as a speakeasy in the 1920s and by the 1940s it becomes kind of a show bar and a um, kind of gay friendly bar. Uh, I think a lot of gay bars in America that are really old trace themselves back to speakeasy because think about this, speakeasies are illegal operations. Why not make more money by catering to kind of marginal segments of the community as well? So if you're going to, speakeasies happen to be the first place in America where men and women go out drinking together. But it's not only men and women, but it's straight people and gay people too. So by the 1940s, it's a bar called Maxine's, which has stayed through the 1980s. Now in my archives, we have some wonderful memorabilia from Maxine's. Now this is an ad from Maxine's in the 1940s. Again, it's that phrase you'll see over and over in the 1940s and 50s in Philadelphia, places called musical bars. So it's a small bar. You might have someone on the piano. You might have a single act. I've seen everything from Spanish dancers to comedians to people doing roller skating acts in these clubs, uh, but they call themselves musical bars. This all com comes to a crash in the middle of the 1950s when people are not going out to see that kind of entertainment, when they can turn Ed Sullivan on their TV set and sit home and watch it. So Maxine's, this matchbook that I have from the 40s, calls it Ed King's Maxine's. So I wondered who the hell was Ed King, did some research and found that that Ed King was uh, an employee when Maxine's was a speakeasy in the 20s, bought it in the late 30s, and turned it into a legitimate club in the 40s. And we were gifted at my archives with this box, which contains 
something really wonderful, the guest book from Maxine, from about 1945 to about 1972 or so. And this is Ed King, and this is his wife. They got divorced. Great story about that. I got to meet his grandsons, um, which, which I'll tell you about in a second. But one thing that we got was the guest book from Maxine. And what Ed did was made the cast of every show that tried out in Philadelphia welcome at Maxine's for dinner after the show. You know that in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, even through the 60s, Broadway shows tried out in Boston, in New Haven, definitely in Philadelphia, because we were the closest big city to New York. So cast came, and we have this guest book that is, has about 120 entries of every almost every show that tried out in Philadelphia. So we have uh, autographs from um, Rosalind Russell, from Tallulah Bankhead, you name it. Uh, this is just one page from it, and all of you invited to come in to see this because it's an amazing piece of ephemera. This is from 1960 when Lucille Ball was starring in a show called Wildcat, uh, which was pretty much a flop. Um, and the reason for that is pretty obvious. Even though everyone loved Lucy Ball, she had kind of finished her I Love Lucy show by then. Um, it was a musical, and poor Lucy had to sing and dance. Uh, and if all of you have ever seen Lucy Ball either sing or dance, you know why the show flopped. I hate to say it because everyone loves Lucy. And I do too, but she is no singer and she is no dancer. But here, here's the page with her signature. She had dinner there and along with her came her still husband at the time. They're about to break up, uh, Desi Arnaz. Maxine closes in the 80s. Um, Ed King doesn't die, but he sells it off. So this, I, I have to tell you this quick story because this is one of the reasons I love working in archives and I love doing history. It's the personal that really makes history come alive, doesn't it? So these two guys contacted the archive and they showed up. They were lovely. One of them lived here, one of them lived, in, lived on the West Coast. And both of them had done DNA testing through 23andMe. And they found out, not, this was just two years ago, not knowing at all, they were full brothers. So Ed King's son, Ed King Jr., had dated this woman. She had a baby. She put it up for adoption. She got married. This is a wonderful story. Fooled around with Ed King on the side, had another baby, and kept that baby. So the two babies had been separated all their lives. And they showed up at the center. These guys were just wonderful, were amazing. Um, they hooked up after ne having never met each other. They had never seen a picture of their grandfather. Uh, we had a picture of Ed King at baseball stadium in North Philly. He was uh, a big baseball fan. And with him was a little boy. And from the date of the picture, we know that that was their father, whom they had never seen a picture of. So one of them only knew their mother. One of them had never known their mother or their father. So we just, it, the, the fact that we had this available in the archives was just so wonderful and so moving to me. Um, that material we have would make such an impact on someone's life. So we not only showed them all the material, but we went and showed them the bar and the space that their grandfather had built 40 years before. Uh, and had left. So Maxine's closed in the 80s after struggling on for a long time, becomes a bar called Raffles, and then today um, it's of course Tavern on Kamak. So I like to call Tavern on Kamak the oldest space, commercial space in the city, since it goes way back to being a speakeasy in the 20s uh, as being the oldest kind of gay identified commercial space in the city which I think is important. Just a couple doors down from Tavern on Kamak, um, on the corner of, this is Manning Street here. There's a bar on the corner. There was a place on the corner, and this is from 1914. It was called Le Coin d'Or, the Golden Corner. Uh, and it was a just gastronomical club. It was kind of a restaurant, but it was private 
It was a cl private club where men could go and kind of and eat food made by one of the one of the first French chefs in the city. In the 1970s, it became a gay dining club called Camp Williamsburg for a few years, uh, and it was. It was kind of for older people at a piano lounge downstairs and two dining rooms upstairs. And then by the end of the 70s, all of you remembered De Cheminet, which was in that location. Well, those of you that have been here for a long time. De Cheminet uh, had a huge fire in it in 1987 and then moved down the end of the block uh, right onto the building in the corner on Spruce Street. And De Cheminet closed probably about 15 years ago now. Or so I think it was still open when I moved to Philadelphia. Moving down to the end of the block, I love this building. And this is one of the buildings that they, this is one of the spaces on Camac Street. I think that there are more made up stories about uh, than any other building. Uh, this building, of course, was a gay bar, it didn't begin as a gay bar, called the Venture Inn. Uh, from the 1950s, and it closed about 2002, 2003 or so. It begins further on down the block in the space where the Kamak Baths were uh, by these two women opened as a, what was called tea room, called the Venture Gardens. So tea rooms were places kind of run by single women in the 20s. They were places where independent women could go into business. And they would open these little lunch rooms where they served cucumber sandwiches and cold soup and tea like that. Sometimes they served knickknacks. They sold knickknacks to make the place run. Then the two women moved down the block and opened the Venture Tea Room. And here's a postcard from about 1922 or so in that space. Uh, they opened a place called the Venture Tea Room in that building. Before that, the building was built as a stable for this building here, which would be the row home on Spruce Street, just south of it. So this was the stable for it. The last major tenants in here, one of the tenants was a family of Quakers. Uh, the last major tenant around the turn of the last century was the rector of St. Luke's Episcopal Church, which is further down on 13th Street. Uh, and I think because the Quakers lived there, one of the stories that uh, the Venture Inn liked to tell itself, and most of the stories that I hear about the Venture Inn are places that the business themselves so publicized. So they like to say that they were stopped on the Underground Railroad. And I think it's because of the Quaker connection, the Quakers being against slavery at the time. They also like to say that the Barrymores lived there, uh, which was ridiculous. They didn't. The Barrymores uh, lived up in the art museum area on Green Street, where the three Barrymores were raised by their grandmother. But right across the street from this building is a little apartment building called the Barrymore Apartments. And I don't know whether the Barrymore Apartments were named after the story or the story was named, the, the story got uh, spread because of the name of the apartment buildings. I don't know. But the Venture Inn, last building that was there, and the Venture Inn was a, a, a mixed bar in the 1950s and 1960s. I talked to people who hung out there in the 1960s and they said a lot of college kids hung out there, but a lot of gay men hung out there too. And it becomes a gay bar by the 1970s. Now here is what I really love about this building. This thing. I walked by this so many times and I said, what the hell is this? Where did it come from? Well, I don't know how I just accidentally discovered what it is, but it's a picture of an infant in swaddling clothes. So wrapped up in these swaddling clothes. It's an exact copy. It's taken from a 15th century orphanage in Florence, Italy, uh, called the uh, Ospedale dei Infanti. And these round pieces of art one is called a tondo, so two of them are called tondi. These tondi, or round pieces of uh, ceramic art, were all around the building in Florence, and this is an exact copy of one of them. And this appears about 1895 or so. I don't know who put it up, 
any of you know anything about this or come across anything, I would love to know. This is the biggest mystery to me, but it's still here. And it's been up on the side of that former stable now for over a hundred years. And I think that's absolutely marvelous. So the Venture Inn stayed as kind of a quiet gay bar until it closed in the about 2015, uh, two, a little after 2000 or so. Um, this building here was a gay bathhouse. This is the corner of uh, St. James um, for a long time, was a private club called the Meridian Club in the early 20th century. And all of you may remember, may or may not remember this, it was a restaurant called Bramwell's for about two years. Uh, and here's a photo of Brad, of Randolph's there. Um, the place that was the Kamak Baz for a couple of years in 1981 to 1983 was the home of the Gay Community Center of Philadelphia before we moved into our new home in 1996, really. Uh, I'm sorry, this is wrong, 1990 to 19. Uh, 96, it was a gay community center. Before then, the gay community center was in the old uh, Lincoln apartments uh, on the side there, which were redone and then burned and now have been redone again. And those are a whole other story. Um, the whole Lincoln apartments. It was home to the Girl Scouts of Philadelphia for a while. So these were in those buildings. So these buildings have so many different community connections, really. It's actually pretty amazing. Oh, this is a friend of mine uh, named Joe DeMarco, who writes these gay mystery novels. And he asked me to plug this. I, I left it off when I was doing the, this talk for the William Morris Way Center. But he does these gay um, mystery novels. One is called Murder on Kamak. So the area really doesn't begin to change until the late 1970s, when because of uh, urban renewal, many of the buildings are raised and redone. So this is actually Locust Street here. Uh, Kamak Street would be running here. Here's a picture in 1977, right after the street was done for the first time. And I think this woman is crossing right at where the Franklin Inn is along these new wooden blocks that are there. So this strip of Locust Street, um, this building here actually is where Jules Junker lived, right in one of these buildings here. And some of you remember Locust Street from the 19th century when people referred to it as the Strip or Lord Locust Street. Uh, it was already becoming kind of a gay neighborhood, but it was also a sleazy red light district. Um, these two bars here, in particular, the one uh, to the right was called the Bag of Nails. The one on the left was called the Golden 33 because it was at 1233 uh, Locust Street. Uh, the bars were continually being raided. These buildings were eventually torn, torn down. These buildings were torn down and rebuilt. And these two buildings are still there in the center of the block. So in the 1970s, when the area was really kind of at its low point, uh, police would raid the club, uh, Club 33, Golden 33, all the time, because this is what happened to those musical bars in the neighborhood. Uh, as TV and other things made an impact, where it was not feasible to have a live entertainment there that was quality. And before then, the people who came to Center City, Philadelphia to perform were big names. There were people like Ella Fitzgerald and Frank Sinatra and Cab Calloway and Louis Armstrong. It was really top-notch entertainment. That didn't become feasible. So to keep the crowd happy, you put a row of chorus girls there. Well, by the 1950, that row of chorus girls become strippers. And the whole tone of the place has changed. And those musical bars become what are called bust out joints. Now, does this mean anything to any of you old enough to know what a bust out joint is or what a B girl is? Have you all heard the term B girl? I'm, but a B girl is someone who works in the bar 
who hustles drinks. So she sits on a customer's lap or sits next to him and orders a bottle of whiskey for him. And of course, uh, she's drinking tea that looks like whiskey and he's drinking watered down alcohol. And before you know it, it's 1953 and he spent $120, which is a fortune then in this bar. So that's what happened to those bars. So it's a sleazy area. It's a really sleazy area. Club 33 is being raided all the time in 1970 because the performers there, meaning the strippers on the stage, um, are being hauled in for having sex with the customers which kind of the police department frowned on. Until the last time I see a raid there, and it's 1977, just the same year this picture is taken, the police raid the place because they get reports that the stripper is entertaining a birthday party and having sex with all these men in the bar. Till it turns out the birthday party is a member of the Philadelphia Police Department. And so it's kind of a big joke and the whole thing is brushed under the carpet. So since the 1970s, the area has changed really, really remarkable. And um, here, here we are looking down Chemax Street, again, at that same little strip we looked at in the 20s. In 2001, when we were big on renaming streets in the city, and uh, under Renbell, when South Broad got named, the Avenue of the Arts, someone thought it'd be really cute to rename this tiny street the Avenue of the Artists. So this little red sign was put up in 19, uh, 2001. As far as I can tell, it's the only street sign with that name on it. There's none on the north side of Kamak, so this is absolutely the only one. And of course, it's really confusing, uh, confusing because we have the Avenue of the Artists, only one block from the Avenue of the Arts. So the whole thing really doesn't make much sense at all. Uh, but there's kind of a brief overlook at the in, entire history of Ken Axtree. 